Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1060, Trigonometry for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In lecture nine, and many of the subsequent lectures as well, we're gonna talk about graphing the six trigonometric functions. Now, in order to graph a function, whether it's a trigonometric function, algebraic function, or something else, there's a few important ingredients that we need to consider. That is, what are some of the, what's the anatomy of a function graph? What are things we need to see in the graph to really say that this is the graph of a function? Now, in this video, the things I really want to talk about is the idea of domain range and zeros, which is something you've possibly seen in a previous class about algebra or functions, but we're going to review that right now. So the domain of a function, let's say the function is given as f, this is going to be a set of all values for which f can be evaluated. That is the set of all possible inputs. Um, and similarly, the range of the function f is the set of all values of the form f of c. Uh, that is to say, c is some number in the domain. We then plug it into the function and we evaluate it. So the range is the set of all possible outputs. And so if we think about that for a moment, we have our x and y axis, maybe something like this. We have x right here and y right here. And suppose we have a function that's doing something like this. Right, so this is our function. This is just some function f right here. So the domain is going to be the set of all points in on the x-axis for which there's something that actually is associated to it. So like here's a point in the domain, here's a point in the domain. All of these functions are defined right here. Uh, excuse me, the function is defined for all these different points. And for the most part, when it comes to, at least to trigonometry, the only time we have to worry about being outside the domain is when we divide by zero. That's not a problem for sine and cosine, but that will be a problem for the four other trigonometric functions. So division by zero is the main issue we get when it comes to domain. Range, on the other hand, can be often be restricted based upon how high and how low the function can go. Sort of like the limbo line right there. If we look at this function right here, we come down here, okay, but we can come up to here, uh, coming down here, all the way up to here, and then down again, right? We see that there, these are all these values in the domain. If we look at the y coordinates here, the y coordinates include all these points right here, then going back down, we got all the points down here, then we go back all the way up to the points up here, and then we go down again, right? So the range is going to be all of the y coordinates that actually appear on the graph. Uh, again, this is something we've probably seen in a previous algebra course. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about are these zeros, are the so-called x-intercepts of the graph. Uh, where does the graph cross the x-axis? So the zeros are exactly those numbers c, such that f of c is equal to zero. Where are these x-intercepts? So looking at the graph, we can see there's an x-intercept here and here and here. And without more of the picture, that's the only thing we could suggest at this moment. So these are going to be the x-intercepts of this graph right here. So if we switch over our, well, if we switch our focus to the trigonometric functions, what can we say about them? Uh, like what about sine and cosine? What are their domains? What are their ranges? What are their uh, zeros? So to help us with this, we're gonna think about the unit circle diagram. That is, we have the X and Y axis from before. If we think of the typical unit circle, that's a respectable looking circle. It's close enough, right? It looks circular in shape. What are the possible angles that can go inside of sine? So when we think of the domain, we want the possible input. The input of sine is going to be the angles. What angles is sine defined for? So if we think about these possible terminal, uh, terminal sides of an angle, here's theta. Well, Theta would be defined for that angle, sine would be defined for that one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. It turns out that any angle you choose, sine is going to be defined, because what is sine after all? Sine is the y-coordinate of these points on the unit circle. So sine theta is just the y-coordinate. No matter where you are on the unit circle, the, the y-coordinate is defined, so sine will be defined as well. So this tells us that the domain of sine is going to be all real numbers. So it's domain, so we write that out, the domain of sine is going to equal all real numbers. In interval notation, we write that from negative infinity to infinity. So when we graph the sine function, its range will be all real numbers. This is also true for cosine for the same reason, right? It doesn't matter which angle you choose, the x coordinate is defined on the unit circle. Therefore, that point will be defined. So the domain and the domain of sine and cosines can be all real numbers. Range is a little bit different though. Uh, 
Um, if we think of like this angle right here, the y coordinate at this point for, for zero degrees, the y coordinate is going to be zero. So sine can equal zero. As we go increase the angle in the first quadrant, we can get all the way up to a 90 degree angle, in which case the point is going to be zero one. So sine can get as big as one, but in the second quadrant, as you pick these other angles right here, you're going to get smaller, smaller y coordinates on the unit circle coming down to the point negative one zero. So we're back down to zero. If we continue down, that is picking smaller and smaller angles, excuse me, larger, larger angles. This is going to go smaller and smaller y coordinates till we get down to this point here, which we're going to get zero negative one, which then in the fourth quadrant, the angles as they get bigger, 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 will get larger and larger y coordinates going back to one zero and then you'll notice that the graph is just gonna well i should say the the sine ratios will repeat themselves over and over and over and over and over again after that so when it comes down to sine we see that sine it, it, it can be zero up to one down to zero back to negative one and it does it all over and over again of course we get things in between it like sine can equal one half if we take 30 degrees uh, but it turns out sine never gets bigger than one. The biggest sine could ever be, the biggest y coordinate on the unit circle is at the very tip top of the circle. The biggest sine could be is one. The very smallest that sine could be is at the very bottom of the unit circle, which is going to be negative one. And so for that reason, the range of sine is going to be negative one to one. And this is the interval notation here. Y can can equal negative one on the unit circle, so so can sine, and then y could equal one on the unit circle, uh, therefore sine, that's the biggest value it could be. So sine is bounded above by one, and it's bounded below by negative one. So if we make that recording right here, we see that the range, the range of sine is gonna equal negative one to one. Now this same statement's gonna be true for cosine as well. If we think of the angle as the angle goes around, you have zero, one, you go up to the top of the unit circle, you get zero, uh, excuse me, you get one, zero first, then you get zero, one second. Then you come down here, you're gonna get negative one, zero. Come all the way down here, you're gonna get zero, negative one, and then back to one, zero. In this situation, now if we focus on the X coordinates, the X coordinate starts at one, it shrinks to zero, then it continues to shrink to negative one. Then the x coordinate is going to grow, 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 grow until we get to zero. Then it'll grow, 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 grow until we get back to one. And so we see that cosine, the x coordinate, will also be bounded by these two numbers just for different reasons, right? Uh, the biggest the x coordinate could be is on the right hand side at one. The smallest the x coordinate could be is negative one on the left hand side of the unit circle. So we see that the range of cosine is likewise going to equal. Uh, negative one to one. So domain and range of sine and cosine are actually the same thing. Sine and cosine have the same domain. Sine and cosine have the same range. All right. The one important difference though is going to be the zeros. Where is sine equal to zero? Where is cosine equal to zero? So putting these points back on the screen here, they seem to be important to us here. If we look at sine for a moment, like so, where's sine? Where's the sine coordinate excuse me, when's the y coordinate equal to zero? Well, that's going to happen when you're on the y axis right here. When you're on the y axis, that means start again in three, two, one. Where is the y coordinate equal to zero? Well, that's going to happen on the x axis right here. Notice that when you're on the x-axis, it's exactly those points whose y-coordinate is zero. These are going to be the places right here where sine of theta is equal to zero. It happens here and it happens here. This tells us that sine theta equals zero exactly when theta equals zero or pi radians, 90 degrees, same thing. Uh, but if, this is, of course, only when you go around the unit circle once. When you go around the cer unit circle again, it's going to repeat itself. So if you have... You have zero, you have pi. You're also gonna get two pi, because that's the same thing as zero. Then you're gonna get three pi, that's the same thing as pi. Then you're gonna get four pi, that's coterminal to zero. You're gonna get five pi, which is coterminal to pi. And that's also, that if you go the other direction as well, if you go clockwise, negative pi, uh, two, negative two pi, negative three pi, all of these uh, coterminal angles will also give you zeros as well. The zeros are gonna be showing up over and over and over again for sine. Uh, 
So when it comes to sine, it turns out that the zeros happen at multiples of pi, integer multiples of pi. So 0 pi, 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, negative 7 pi. That's where the zeros of sine occur. So sine theta equals 0 when theta is a multiple of pi. For cosine, where is this going to happen? Well, if you're looking for a cosine, which measures the x-coordinate, the x-coordinate is going to be 0 when you're on the y-axis, like we see right here. x is 0 and x is 0, just like so. And so for cosine, cosine will be 0 at pi halves, 90 degrees, at 3 pi halves, 270 degrees, and then you're going to repeat itself. You go up here, this would be 5 pi halves, then you're going to get 7 pi halves, then 9 pi halves, then 11 pi halves, and you just go over and over and over again. And of course, if you go clockwise, you're going to get negative pi halves, negative 3 pi halves, negative 5 pi halves, negative, uh, where are we at, negative 7 pi halves. You're going to get the same things over and over again, but in different locations, of course. So for cosine, for cosine, we should mention that cosine will be 0 when theta is either pi halves or 3 pi halves. Uh, but also, if you add any multiple of 2 pi to that, you're going to get uh, another 0 as well. So the zeros of cosine are going to be pi halves plus any multiple of pi. When discussing the graphs of sine and cosine, it's often important to talk about their amplitude. This will be especially true when we start modifying uh, the sine and cosine waves in future lectures. So in general, for a function uh, y equals f of x, let capital M be the largest value in its range and let little m be the smallest value in its range. So m is the biggest, little m is the smallest. Then we say the amplitude of a, of a function is going to be the difference between the large value with the small value and we take half of that. So basically it tells you uh, on average how far away from the middle can you go. And this is the idea of amplitude. And we're going to see this later on with our trigonometric functions. The amplitude tells you how far above the x-axis you go and how below the x-axis you go. So the amplitude is a way of measuring the size of the range of a function. Now, sine of theta is always bounded above by 1. That is, sine is less than or equal to 1, but it's bounded below by negative 1. Sine is uh, greater than or equal to negative 1. And so this gives us the capital M and the lowercase m. So the amplitude for sine is going to be 1 half the absolute value of 1 minus negative 1, like so. So the reason you take this difference, this tells you how big the range is going to be. So you're going to get a 2 right there. Uh, the absolute value, of course, is 2. So you get 2 over 2, which gives you 1. So for your typical sine uh, function, it's going to go 1 above the x-axis and 1 below the x-axis. And it does that about equally likely. <laughs> cosine does the same thing. Cosine is bounded above by 1. It's bounded below by negative 1, so the amplitude for cosine is likewise going to equal 1. We won't go into as much detail with tangent, secant, cotangent, and cosecant as we did with sine and cosine, but let's briefly talk about their range domain and zeros as well. So for the domain of tangent and secant, the thing to remember is that tangent is the same thing as sine theta over cosine theta. And so it's a fraction. Sine and cosine are defined for any angles, but fractions can be undefined if the denominator is equal to zero. So when is tangent undefined? Well, that happens when cosine is equal to zero. When is cosine equal to zero? Well, that happens, as we saw earlier, when theta equals pi halves plus a multiple of pi. Uh, so the domain of tangent is going to be all numbers except for these ones right here. At this place, you're going to get a vertical asymptote. Um, secant, on the other hand, secant is equal to 1 over cosine. So it has the same problem. The numerator is always 1, but the denominator is going to be cosine. And so if cosine is 0, that means secant will be undefined. So tangent and secant will be undefined when cosine is equal to 0. In terms of their, their x-intercepts, though, when is tangent equal to 0? Well, you have a fraction. The only way a fraction can equal 0 is if its numerator is equal to 0. So tangent is equal to 0 exactly when sine is equal to 0. And as we observed earlier, sine is equal to 0 when theta equals a multiple of pi. Now, on the other hand, can secant ever equal 0? Well, a fraction, like I said, can only equal 0 if the numerator is equal to 0. But the numerator here is 1. That can't equal 0. So it turns out that secant can never equal 0 uh, as it's the reciprocal function to cosine. And so if we say a little bit about the range right here, it turns out that tangent can actually be 
uh, can equal all real numbers. We'll give a little bit more detail about that when we talk about the graphs of tangent. Secant, um, it, it can be most numbers. It can get arbitrarily big. That is, you can, secant can go off towards infinity or negative infinity, but you can't get small values of secant. That is to say, secant, um, secant of theta, it is always greater than or equal to, well, I should say its absolute value is always greater than or equal to 1. Uh, secant can be positive or negative. It's always going to be greater than 1 in terms of its absolute value. You can't get stuff that's close to the x-axis, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later. Cotangent and cosecant basically do the same thing. Cotangent, of course, is the same thing as cosine theta over sine theta. And so when is, when is cotangent undefined? It'll be undefined when sine is equal to zero and sine is equal to zero at multiples of pi. Cosecant, same thing. Cosecant is one over sine theta. So when sine is equal to zero, cosecant is undefined. Um, in terms of their zeros, right? Cotangent uh, is equal to zero when cosine is equal to zero. That happens at pi halves plus a multiple of pi. Cosecant can never equal zero because the numerator is, is always going to be a one there. In terms of their range, uh, same basic thing as before. We'll go into more details about this later. Cotangent can equal all real numbers and cosecant, if you take its absolute value, its absolute value is always greater than equal to one. That is, cosecant is either larger than equal to one or less than or equal to negative one. Sort of the opposite of what sine is doing. And we'll get into those details later 